Tennessee Athletics is introducing a new ticketing system to get more fans to UT football games. It's called Vol Pass. For $280, fans can get the opportunity to attend each Vol home game. You're guaranteed a ticket, but it may not be the same seat. Each week, fans will be able to select tickets starting the Monday before each game and will get a mobile ticket on their phone. The university says it has been using the Vol Pass system for men's and women's basketball for the last three seasons. Two families are coming to terms with the death of loved ones after police say a man tied to a traveling carnival killed them. What we know about the suspect and how those families are grieving. It's now the strictest abortion law in the country. The legal challenges Alabama's new plan could face and how it could challenge Roe versus Wade. Also, birth rates in the U.S. are dropping. What's behind the 32-year low? We'll hear from doctors. We can't accept, we just don't want to accept that this has happened. You, nobody deserves this. Families are coming to terms with their loved ones' deaths. This after police say a man associated with a traveling carnival killed three women in the small town of Mendota, Virginia. One of the women was Elizabeth Van Meter. Her family says she worked with the suspect at that carnival. Police say the suspect, James Wright, confessed to the murders and says he dumped the women's bodies around his house. Another victim's mother in Georgia says she learned about her daughter's death on social media and wants the suspect to pay. Here's Philip Kish. Joycelyn Alsup's mother calls her 17-year-old daughter a weekend runaway. She would sneak off to friends' houses, but always called later to say where she was and that she was okay. She would run away since October of last year. At least every weekend she would go. In early March, Cynthia Butterworth reported her daughter missing to the Cobb County Sheriff's Office. 
This time, she did not call home. There's still no word. She's not showed up. And it's like, this is not, this is not her. Then this Monday, two months after Alsop went missing, Butterworth noticed her daughter's name being mentioned on social media, and she watched a press conference held by the Washington County Sheriff's Office in Virginia. A Washington County, Virginia man has been charged with three counts of capital murder. This is how Butterworth says she learned about her daughter's death. I replayed it. God only knows how many times. And I just could not believe they were talking about her. The sheriff's office says 23-year-old James Michael Wright is the man charged with Alsop's murder. They say when he confessed, he claimed it was an accidental shooting. He's also charged with the murders of 25-year-old Athena Hobson and 22-year-old Elizabeth Van Meter, both of Tennessee. Investigators say they are still searching for Hobson's body. After her family met Wright at the fair in Cobb County last year, Butterworth says she found a message from him to Alsop on social media. Um, I will marry you. And I'm like, okay, that's just creepy. So I told her not to, you know, have anything to do with him anymore. And as far as I knew, she didn't. And even though Alsop would run away, Butterworth says her daughter would not leave the state. She believes her daughter was kidnapped or tricked into leaving, and she blames Wright. He needs the death penalty, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I know it sounds mean, but God forbid, I'm taking anybody's child and babies, and, you know, it's not just Joyce Lynn, it's the others, and... He needs to, even torture is too good for him. James Wright is charged with three counts of capital murder. He said the deaths of all three women were accidental, though investigators, as you heard, do not believe that is the case. We're turning now to your forecast, and it's been in and out sun today, mm -hmm. yeah. but comfortable temperatures as we are talking about, but oh, just wait. Yeah, <laughs> a rapid warm up summer like conditions, not only temperatures, but humidity values. Those mm -hmm. dew points will be rising over the next few days. Uh, 72 degrees here in North Knoxville, Channel 10 as a little bit more late afternoon, now early evening sunshine and some thinning of the clouds is taking place. Speaking of the clouds, this is a six hour satellite radar composite. You can see that clustering complex of showers and storms pretty much stay to our south and west today. Middle Tennessee and the northern Alabama, parts of Chattanooga, the southern plateau and the southern valley saw a little patchy light rain sprinkles really haven't seen much here in the valley. Valley. Just the cloud cover that did keep our temperatures in the 60s for much of the day. But again, kind of this uh, late afternoon, now early evening recovery is a little bit more sunshine starting to come out with the thinning of the clouds right there, especially from Knoxville, La Follette, Huntsville, Jamestown, Crossville. You're seeing uh, partly cloudy skies, a little bit more sunshine, a little bit more cloud cover still for Maryville, Townsend and down toward Teleco Plains. Matter of fact, in Sevierville, you're still looking at mostly cloudy skies. That's a current view right there. Here's what it looks like from Sharps Ridge, still mostly cloudy and Knoxville and looking toward those same mountains and at the airport right now for Knoxville still 68 degrees with a calm wind pressure falling humidity 50% dew point temperature 49 degrees so check out the temperatures around the region 68 La Follette no Ridge, 69 North City to Sweetwater 66 still kind of coolish in Athens 67 Teleco Plains to Bryson City Pigeon Forge mostly cloudy 66 degrees for you and 67 in Dandridge 66 in Morristown 63 for you on the plateau and cross a little bit of scattered light rains earlier and now you're seeing some sunshine. So here's a look at the recap. This complex of showers and clouds though having an impact on the temperatures from Nashville to Knoxville to Chattanooga in the 60s. Also Lexington, Kentucky, Charleston, West Virginia in the 60s. So still impressively this cool air hanging around. Not for long, 86 degrees in Memphis, and that rapid warm up is heading our way. Look at all these 80s throughout much of the Plain States. It's 84 in Bismarck, North Dakota. It's 81 in Billings, Montana, and in Salt Lake City. It's 82 in Denver. You got a 97 on the board in Phoenix. So we've definitely got some summer like temperatures on the playing field, on the map, so to speak, and all that's going to be heading eastward. So again, the clouds slowly decrease, partly cloudy tonight, more sunshine working its way into our region for Thursday. Our future cast, inter interestingly, is showing another little complex of thunder showers possible midday Friday. We'll see if that verifies. I think it may actually be a little bit more to our east, but may see a quick round of a few thunder showers Friday, but otherwise temperatures warm and summer like to round it out this week into the upcoming weekend. Milder tonight, 55 for the low, partly cloudy and much warmer for your Thursday. Mostly sunny. We're going 81 tomorrow again, three straight days in the 60s. Now we're talking 80s and look at that 88 on the board Saturday, a 30% chance for spotty thunder showers, 86 Sunday, a little better chance 
by Monday, but staying very warm. We just fast forwarded to July. Yes. How did that happen? More of that to come heading toward Memorial Day. By oh the boy. Way. All right. Thank you. Well, the FCC is proposing new ways for phone companies to crack down on those robocalls. Officials say the number of robocalls is skyrocketing. The FCC has been pushing phone service providers to improve how they authenticate caller ID information. The new rule will require phone carriers to automatically opt in all of their customers to robocall blocking technology. Right now, you have to manually sign up. Allowing these phone companies to block robocalls by default, we think will stem the tide, which has been overwhelming for many consumers and has led too many consumers to stop answering their phones altogether. The FCC says there's no silver bullet but for stopping them, but if the proposals are approved, customers could notice fewer calls later this summer. Now, if you can't wait that long, there are some apps that you can use to block robocalls right now. The developers of RoboKiller claim that app can reduce unwanted calls by up to 90% in just 30 days. It's free to download, but requires a subscription eventually. Wide Protect Spam Call Per Blocker Wide Protect Spam Call Blocker, just to get it right, is perfect for people who don't want to pay a subscription. Once you buy the app, you can get all of its features, even blocking spammers using local phone numbers, unwanted texts, and more. It costs $2.99 for iOS and Android. CBD is in everything, including beauty products. Why doctors say they still don't know much about the effects of that product. Well, coming up tomorrow morning on 10 News Today, are you looking for a fun way to spend the day? We found the perfect destination, just a short drive from Knoxville. From antiques to hand-spun milkshakes, historic downtown Clinton has something for everyone. We'll take you on the tour tomorrow, starting at 427.
CBD seems to be in almost everything these days. Shampoo, oils, gummies, people loyal to the cannabis derived products say it can heal ailments and reduce anxiety. But what about the beauty products that it's popping up in? Should you be rubbing it on your face? Haley Hernandez has the story. As a reminder, CBD does not contain THC, which is found in marijuana and gives a high. And since CBD has become legal in many states, it's taking off in products faster than researchers can say who should use it. Dr. Sherry Ingraham says she anticipates this will benefit some people with skin problems like acne. What's really exciting is this new advent of CBD and skin products. We know CBD can be anti-inflammatory. The downside is we don't have a lot of data yet, so we're really embarking on a new area of CBD containing products. And as time goes on, we're going to have more information. The risk with not having enough data is that doctors are unclear what the side effects are. So when we get the data, we'll know specifically what skin conditions they can benefit and how best they can help our skin. And I'm really excited and looking forward to seeing that data. Dr. Ingraham said there's likely a very small percentage of CBD and makeup products, so it probably does not hurt to try it. But with anything, you may have a reaction and not know which ingredient causes the reaction. So test it on a small patch of skin before rubbing it all over. That doctor also warns against ordering CBD products online where you might not know exactly what you are getting. All this week on 10 News Nightbeat, we've been breaking down Marijuana 101. Online right now, you can find where it is legal, the difference between the types of marijuana and hemp, as well as CBD, and where East Tennessee lawmakers stand on proposed legalization. You can also read the emotional story of one woman who claims medical marijuana helped cure her. That's already on our website at WBIR.com. And tonight on the Night Beat, an epidemic of drug crimes continues to crowd our jails and cost taxpayers thousands of dollars. But how much of the local jail overcrowding can be blamed on marijuana? We put that question to the top prosecutor in Knox County. What do you think is in people's minds that just simply isn't true? I hear people say that there are a lot of folks in jail based simply on possession of marijuana. Not true. Not true at the county level. Not true at the state level. The amount of marijuana it takes to put a first-time offender in jail may shock you. We'll have that answer tonight at 11 on the Night Beat. The state of Alabama just passed the most restrictive abortion law in the U.S. Why the state says it's necessary and critics say it's gone too far. Plus, you can weigh in right now on that question at WBIR.com slash vote. I'm trying to get this on. Looks like we're at the end of this. Okay. I think it is, Bethy. <clears throat> How are you? Yes. How did the project go? You're working on. Uh, I'm I'm really bad in the house. <laughs> we typically.
Alabama has a new abortion law making it the strictest state in the country. Your chance to weigh in on that controversial plan and the legal challenges it could create in the Supreme Court. Birth rates in the U.S. are at a 32-year low. Why doctors believe the numbers are changing so rapidly? And the good news from the same study. Playing catch with the Vol baseball standout, the difference he's made this season, and where the Tennessee baseball team stands right now. Straight from the heart of East Tennessee, this is 10 News at 5. Alabama is the latest state to pass new abortion restrictions. Now, this law is the most restrictive in the country. It makes the procedure a felony at any point during a pregnancy, and doctors who perform abortions could face up to 99 years in prison. We want to know what you think about the controversial me measure. You can vote now at WBIR.com slash vote or using the WBIR app. In the meantime, NBC's Jay Gray reports on the potential Supreme Court showdown the bill could kickstart. House Bill 314 passes. Overnight, a message from Alabama state lawmakers to the Supreme Court. Is the baby in a womb a person? And we believe technology and science shows that it is. Alabama's legislature passing the most restrictive abortion bill in the nation, making the procedure at any phase during a pregnancy a felony, with providers facing up to 99 years in prison. The only exception when a pregnancy represents a serious health risk to the mother. Well, I'm appalled. I think it's a setback for the women of Alabama, not only the women of Alabama, but the women of the whole United States. It's now up to the governor to decide if it becomes law. It's an issue that is very difficult and people had, have to address that and when I get the bill, I'll review it thoroughly. The bill's sponsor readily admits her goal is to get America's highest court to review the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, giving women the right to choose when it comes to abortion. I, Brett M. Kavanaugh, do solemnly swear. With two new conservative justices appointed by President Trump, 29 states have now introduced new restrictive abortion measures. Last week, Georgia joining three other states outlawing abortion at the first sign of a fetal heartbeat. Jay Gray, NBC News. And Tennessee passed a law this year that would go into effect if Roe versus Wade is ever overturned. So we ask what you think of the plan. Many of you sharing your thoughts with us today and 52% uh, of you say it's great. 36% of you, though, say it's not constitutional. Yeah, well, joining us to discuss the potential constitutional challenge to this law, Akram Fazer from Lincoln Memorial University School of Law. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Madam. I would have to imagine that this is going to face um, some challenges from the get-go. Well, this law is the most extreme version that's being, that it, this is not yet a law in Alabama. Right. It's being presented to the governor for her signature, and I anticipate she will sign it in view of political polarization on the issue in Alabama. But the other heartbeat bills, all these laws and proposed bills conflict with the Supreme Court's holding in a case called Casey v. Planned Parenthood, which was issued in 1992, which says that before viability, a woman has a fundamental right to have an abortion and that the state cannot prevent her from having one. And so all these laws textually conflict with that holding from the U.S. Supreme Court. So what's the process then moving forward for this piece of legislation? Well, the proponents of this legislation and the pro-life movement nationwide recognizes this fact. The Supreme Court has changed in composition from 1992, and there is now currently a conservative majority on the Supreme Court that would be dis that most likely disagrees with the previous court holdings, Roe and Casey, which say that a woman has a fundamental right to have an abortion under the U.S. Constitution. So these proponents of these bills know that these bills facially conflict. In other words, they textually are contradicted by the Supreme Court's previous decision. But their hope is that if they enact these laws and they get challenged in court, that it, the, the Supreme Court will choose to review the case and revise Roe and revise Casey and say that abortion is no longer a constitutional right. Yeah, I actually, or to that to that measure, I heard someone today, a lawmaker in Alabama, who said that is indeed what they're wanting to do. Let's get it to the Supreme Court and go ahead and get, get this challenge going on. What does this mean then for other states going forward? So these re this does not really affect other states. However, you could argue 
that if indeed the goal is to have the Supreme Court review these laws, um, that the pro-life movement would be best off having these types of laws be enacted nationwide. Because one of the criteria the Supreme Court looks at in determining whether to review a state law is to see if there's a split between the circuit courts of appeal. So right now there are 12 circuit courts of appeals in the nation, and if there is a diversion in jurisprudence as to how they see these things, maybe the court will review the case. Fundamentally, it comes down to this. There's right now a conservative majority on the court. However, Chief Justice Roberts is the institutional justice. So though he's dis dispositionally, jurisprudentially, and ideologically a conservative, it's an open question as to whether he will want to have the court's legitimacy be potentially jeopardized by having one further bite at the apple in terms of Roe v. Wade. And so that's the kind of difficult thing. How will Chief Justice Roberts view things? The second thing which has to be said is, in terms of public opinion, the American public seems to be, the, the, traditionally it was always the case that the majority of the American public was pro-choice, but pro-life voters were, were the ones who voted on the issue. So there was better domestic politics in terms of being pro-life, especially in red states. The open question, though, is how will people truly react if indeed we reversed Roe v. Wade, we left it back to the states, and we have such pronounced polarization on the issue, it's hard for us to have a discussion as to what should be the actual, legitimate, enforceable restrictions on abortions, as opposed to these extreme measures we're seeing, examples being the heartbeat bill and what is just being proposed in Alabama. These are extremely harsh, extremely burdensome uh, propos proposals, and you would, in my view, almost have to run a police state to enforce them. Fazer from Lincoln Memorial University. As always, we appreciate your time and your insight. Thank My you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.